Thank you, Pramod. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am cert. I hope you guys can hear me clearly, and uh, I am reasonably certain that you guys are also very, very tired now. So, in case you guys are not very tired, let's do a very quick uh, survey. I am told that most of the audience members today are um, faculty members. And before I get started, I want I, I'm going to talk about hidden Markov models, and particularly uh, with a little bit of uh, their applications being discussed. So if you have any experience with the hidden marker models, could you just raise your hands? Uh, that way I'll get an idea of uh, how many of you have actually had any experience with the hidden marker models or you've heard about it or you use them, if, if you have uh, any experience. Because that will allow me to sort of tailor my talk uh, to the level of complexity that is required. We have about 60 minutes to 70 minutes. So I would like to what I, if you have not had any experience with HMLs, what I will do is I'll give you guys a, a fairly a reasonable overview of what uh, HMM is or hidden marker models are and how we can apply them. So there are three fundamental problems of HMMs and we will talk about those three fundamental problems and how we approach them. If needed, I can give you some mathematics behind it, the math behind the HMM, um, uh, decoding the Derby and uh, the learning, parameter learning. So anyway, uh, I'm going to take two minutes and see if you guys can give me some feedback as to if you have any experience with hidden marker models. Have you guys heard of them? Have you used them? Have you studied them? Any, any, just raise your hands. Hello, guys. So nobody has any experience with hidden marker models? No, no, sir, no. Okay, sure. So I guess in that case, what we'll do is we'll sort of take this uh, at a slightly lower level of abstraction. So what I'll do today is introduce you to the notion of an HMM, right? So on that note, let's get started. Let me just very quickly share my uh, slides. I hope uh, this is clear and you guys can see this clearly, everyone? Yes, we can see, we can see now. It's visible, right. sir. Okay, great. So hidden marker models. Uh, have you guys at least heard of this term, hidden marker yes. models or marker models? Okay. Marker right. models, we heard about it. Okay. So uh, let, let's start. Right. So if you think about it, if you think about a process, any process, it doesn't matter, right? If you can observe the process, if you can observe what is going on, then things become quite easy. Okay. It, it, things become quite simple for you, particularly from a learning point of view, because you know how the process is changing. And therefore, if you know how the process is changing, you can predict what it will do, right? For example, if you take a small child, right? If you see, if you can see him, let's say I have a, my, my, my child, right? if, I, if he's eating food on a table, right? Then if I can see the child, then I can figure out based on his movements of how he's eating, whether or not he will spill food or not, right? So, but what if I could not see the child? What if the child is sitting in his room or he's not in my view and all I can do is I can hear his reactions, right? So you can imagine these are two different scenarios and the second scenario becomes a lot more complicated. Would you agree? So hidden yes. Markov models essentially allow you to model such processes where you can't really directly observe the machine or the, the process but rather some consequence of the process. Okay, so just keep that in mind. The other um, notion about, or rather the, the other idea with this particular topic is, we talk about uh, you know, these processes as being state machines, right? So it's like a machine or a process is uh, like a machine, it's abstracted as a machine, which can take different forms. It can be in different states. Right at discrete intervals of time, at discrete moments in time. Now, don't worry about what the quantum of the time is. It could be anything. Right? It could be one second. It could be a millisecond. It could be one year. It could be ten years. It doesn't matter. Right. The only thing that matters is you have to understand that the process, the state, the the it's a sequence of states. Right. So your machine is going through a state of set of changes over time. And you can't observe those changes directly. You can only observe some consequence of those changes or those states. 
Fair enough? Everybody with me on this? Right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, good. So what are hidden muscle bonds? The reason why we call them hidden is because, again, remember, unlike most machine learning uh, applications or domains where the data that you get directly reflects the state of the process, that means it is, it, it, even at, it is uh, literally uh, the process itself, here, the process is hidden from you. The system is hidden from you. The state of the machine is hidden from you. All you can do is observe some consequence, right? To give you another example, let's say I have three bags with marbles. Bag one, bag two, bag three. And each bag has red marbles and blue marbles. Red marbles, blue marbles, red marbles, blue marbles, right? Now, if the person, if you can see the bags, then if I were to ask you, what is the probability of drawing a red marble from one bag? This, the, the answer would be simpler because now you know you know, which bag has been chosen. Right? Now, let's say the bags are hidden from you. Right? So it's a, there's a curtain between you and the bags. And all you can see are the marbles that are being drawn. So now you can only see the consequence of whichever bag was chosen. Right? So this is again a hidden Markovian process, a right? hidden Markovian model. Right? So now it becomes fairly clear to state that HMMs are essentially um, used to model what you call as doubly stochastic processes. Right? So it's not a single stochastic process. It's a process which is inherently stochastic to begin with. And then it generates an event. It generates an emission that itself is again further stochastic or sort of random, right? So, and, and you would be surprised as to how commonly this is being uh, how commonly this is this finds its application because a lot of natural processes in the world, a lot of natural events actually follow this, you know, doubly stochastic uh, phenomenon. Right? You can't see what is causing some event to happen. All you can see is some event. Right? I'll give you another great example before I get into the nitty gritty here. Uh, it has been shown that. If, an, uh, for example, do you remember the last, the previous US elections, right? When Donald Trump was elected the president, right? Yeah. There was a lot of uh, social media uh, activity and a lot of these uh, online uh, food aggregators and uh, pizza companies, et cetera, they used that social media data to figure out the state of the population, their mental state. Why? Because when people are upset, they tend to go for comfort foods, right? So they were able to use social media activity to predict whether a set of population is more likely to order pizza versus more likely to order, you know, lava cakes or stuff like that. So you could do that. You can even do use social media activity of the population to figure out whether they are susceptible to misinformation or not simply by observing their online activity. Right? So we, and we get into that. We'll, we'll discuss this particular problem a little later. And as far as applying HMMs are concerned, right? So uh, HMMs again, are used to model doubly stochastic processes, right? So how do you define an HMM, right? So you take any state, you take a machine that can be in one of N states. It can take, uh, be in one of the N states. For example, if the machine is, me uttering an alphabet, right? So how many alphabets are there in the English language? 26, right? So this state machine can take 26 states. There are 26 distinct states, fair enough? So the, the model, the HMM model that will be used to describe me uttering an alphabet will contain 26 states. Oh, oh, sorry, uh, I clear, I'm, I'm not, Putting it in presentation mode because I would like to write on this. But anyway, uh, here you go. Uh, is that okay? Is that better? I hope that is better. Anyway. Yes, yes. So uh, let's say if I were to utter an alphabet, right? I can only utter one alphabet every second. There are 26 possible alphabets that I can utter. So my state machine, my process can have 26 
distinct states. So we'll denote those states, or, and these states are hidden, right? These states are hidden. So the, uh, those states are Q1, or we'll call them as Q vector, which is a set of states. So Qn, set of n states. And then we have what's called a state transition probabilities, right? So once I have uttered, let's say, A, what is the probability that, that I will utter B next? So I go from A to B, that's a transition probability, right? So if you think about it, if you ask any random person, can we utter an alphabet? They'll say A. So let's say they say A. Then you ask them to utter another alphabet. Chances are they are more likely to utter B rather than say X. Would you agree with that? Right? So which means I can say that the probability of transitioning from letter A to B is possibly higher then transitioning from A to X. It's possible, it's not zero, but it is possible. Guys, are you okay with me? Are you with me on this so far? So this is what you call the transition probability, the state transition probability, right? And again, the, from each state, because you can transition from one state to the other, and any of these states can transition from one to the other, you end up with a matrix of transition probabilities, if you think about it very carefully. Right? And, I'll, and I'll, if you want, I can explain that as well later on, a little, just a little later, right? Now comes the interesting bit. In every state that I am, I'm going to utter a sound. Now that sound denotes, let's say, when I speak the word A, that sound is just a sound, right? It's, it's, a, it's a speech signal, right? And let's say that is the only thing I can observe. Now, for a machine, that sound does not make any sense, right? So that's a symbol for it. For a machine, for a computer system, that is a symbol. So the observed symbols, the observed symbols are, or the event, or the emission, if you will, from each hidden state is an audio sound, right? Is an audio sound. So, uh, and obviously, there are a distinct number of audio sounds that I can make. So in each state, I can emit different kinds of symbols, right? So uh, in each state, we have what we call as emission probability. That means there are there's a distinct probability of making a different kind of sound in each state, right? And why does this make sense? For example. Let's say you're trying to teach a child how to speak or how to recite the English alphabet. They're looking at some symbol. They're reading a, a, the English alphabet. Now, if you think about it, uh, you know, P and Q, when written down together, look quite similar, right? So even if the person, is, the child is looking at the letter Q, there's a probability that he may utter, he or she may utter P. Right? So there's a non-zero probability of uttering different symbols or different audio sounds in different states. Okay, So the, the collection of these emission symbols, they are known as, for the sake of uh, completeness, we call them as vocabularies. Right? So it's the entire vocabulary. And then, so, the, the, and so we'll say B sub I of OT is the emission probability or the observation from a given state i and then you have o which is nothing but the vocabulary of symbols right okay all right and finally the last parameter used to define an hmm model is what it is the initial state it is the initial state vector initial state that means if i just observe the machine at any given moment in time any moment in time, what is the probability that it will be in one of those end states, right? For example, let's say I am a star raving madman who is just sitting here and uttering the English alphabets, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, right? And somebody randomly comes into my room. What is the probability that when he comes in, the probability that I am uttering, let's say, the letter K? So. At any moment in time, when you start your observation, what is the probability 
that I am or the machine is in some state I. Now, obviously, there are n possible states, which means there is going to be a zero or a non-zero probability of the machine being initially in one of those n states. Agreed? Fair enough, guys? Have I lost you guys or are you guys still with me on this? No, we are. Yeah. Are you? Okay, wonderful. Yeah. All right. So we figured out what is the state vector? What are the, what is the vocabulary? What are the emissions? And of course, what are the hidden states? Okay. Right. Now, here come the two fundamental assumptions that make hidden Markov models what they are. Right. And the first assumption is essentially what you call as the Markovian process. Right. It essentially states, it is, well, for the lack of no pun intended, uh, the first assumption is that the next state only depends on the current state. That's it. Nothing prior to that. So, how is it different from stochastic process? Okay. And with the stochastic process, remember, there is no, uh, the next state may depend on the prior states as well, right? They may be a dependence. Right? Because in a stochastic process, uh, the causality is not ignored. Would you agree or not? Yeah, ma'am, Professor, sorry to interrupt you. I'm yeah. Sasi Kumar. Yeah. yeah. So this is a uh, I call all these processes are, or individual elements are completely independent. Can I call completely independent? Uh, well, uh, okay. Because not necessarily. if I am. The okay, if I'm, because stochastic itself includes this causality. If I'm ignoring, then it it follows complete indep independent processes only, no? Fair, fair enough. So let me just finish. Okay. Sorry. So let's I'm in a given state, right? And my transition to the next state, there is a relationship. There's the likelihood that I may go from one state to the other. Yeah. Right? But when I am in the next state, my transition to the next state only and only depends on the current state. Nothing prior to that. Nothing prior to that. Oh, so there is no independence over here. Yeah. There's no independence over here. Okay. So right? in, in this HMM, it's only existing state only, current? not current? related with the previous states. Yeah. That's what I said, right? Yes. The next state only depends on the current state and nothing prior to that. Nothing. nothing. Yeah, got it. So you could have a long process chain prior to the current time state, and all of that is immaterial. Okay. All of that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Great. Great. And this logically makes sense also, right? If you think about it, mm. it also sort of makes sense that what I do next depends on how I'm feeling now. Yeah. Mm. Where I am now depends on what I was feeling previously, just prior to that, right? So. The fundamental assumption of a Markovian process is the, the current state depends only on the immediately prior state or, in other words, the next state depends only on the current state. That's yeah. It. And again, over here, we're talking about the underlying hidden states, right? So the actual state of the machine. Yes. The second assumption is the output independence. That means the output, which is the emission symbol that you're talking about, the, the, the event that you can actually observe, depends only on the current state and nothing else. Okay, so for example, uh, let's take another example. You know, um, and this is again based on physiological responses. Uh, let's say I am, do you know why when police check, do uh, inebriation checks, uh, they ask people to uh, come backwards? Because when they are under the influence of alcohol, their ability to recite the alphabet changes. Agreed? So the question becomes, well, how likely is it that I'll be able to utter a particular sound in I, when I'm in a current state? Okay, fair enough. There's some probability. But does that emission depend on some other state? No. In the current state, the, the emission currently depends only on the current state. Nothing what has happened previously, nothing that will happen next. So keep in mind, these are two distinctly different points. One is, one deals with the state itself, that the current state, the next state only depends on the current state. And second, 
the current emission only depends on the current state, nothing else. Right? Are you with me on this, everybody? Yes. Yes. In other words, in other words, the, if you look at it from a mathematical point of view, the probability that some observation OI depends on the sequence of uh, hidden states Q1, Q2, QI minus one, QI, all this, and some observed sequence O1, O2, OI, all of this depends only on this. Nothing else. Right? So, so this is again quite important, quite uh, significant. Guys, are you with me? Everybody on this? Okay, I'm assuming that you guys are still with me. All right, good. So what's next? Uh, right. So now with these with this background, we can now we end up with three fundamental problems that we try to solve with HMLs, right? Or three three kinds of um, applications, right? So one is the likelihood, right? One is the likelihood. The first problem is, of course, the likelihood problem. That if I give you an HMM model, and the HMM model is defined by what? The, the transition matrices, the, 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 the transition probabilities, the emission probabilities, and the initial state sequence. And I give you an observed sequence. Remember, HMMs are used for temporal events or temporal processing, right? Processes which have a sequential component to it. That means they do depend on one after the other on the previous state, but there is a sequence to it. Right? If I give you an observed sequence, what is the likelihood, what is the probability that that observed sequence will actually occur given this HMM model? So, or in other words, spoken in a, using a different um, uh, form, what is the likelihood that the process that I have just modeled using an HMM will actually provide me this kind of a sequence output? That's point number one. Or the likelihood, what is the probability? Is it likely or not? And if it is, how likely is it? So that's point number one. Point number two, the, the next problem is the D, what we call the decoding. Right? So you again given the observed sequence, right? The observed sequence, that means the emission symbols or the sequence of emitted symbols. And you're given the HMM model, which is being denoted over here by the uh, by this lambda. Oh, oh, this is why I don't like the, the presentation. And by HMM or by the lambda, you have to now figure out what is the most likely sequence of hidden states. In other words, what were the most likely transitions of the system through its different hidden states? Right? How did this process change? What is the most likely way in which the process changed to provide this given observed sequence? That's the decoding. I hope you guys can appreciate the difference between the first and two problems. Right? So the first problem is essentially a simple likelihood, the idea of you know, how likely is something. And the second problem is, well, okay, if it is likely or even if it, you know, whatever it is, if I have a trained model with an HMM or if I have an HMM model that sort of mimics the underlying doubly stochastic process, and I have some data that tells me this is what the process yielded, well, how did my process change? How did my system change over that period of time? Right. The most likely states or sequence of hidden states. Right. And this, it turns out this is the most important part of HMM, right? So this is how HMMs are really most common, commonly deployed. Now, before you can do one or two, before you can do either one or two, you have to go and figure out what your HMM model is. Right? How do you model that doubly stochastic process using a set of transition values, emission probabilities, and hidden initial state vector? How do you get those values? How would you get those values? Now, because we're talking about machine learning, a topic within machine learning, obviously it sort of gives us the hint that we'll have to do some kind of work. We'll need some kind of data to get gather some intelligence out of it to iteratively learn these parameters 
and that's where we call we, we reach we arrive at the learning problem right so how do you figure out the parameters of your hmm model particularly how do you figure out lambda so you're given now a set of observation sequence and a set of corresponding hidden states the training data remember when you talk about training data even if you're talking about supervised learning right in supervised learning you are given the data the feature vector or the sample along with the target value so you get this tuple of the data and the target value and you get you know large number of such tuples and you use those to learn the parameters of let's say the ANN for example right you learn the weights of the ANN using back propagation and gradient descent and all that right Sim something similar happens over here you, you, you're doing this iteratively you're learning the parameters of HML right so this is obviously the 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 required step before you can do one or two, before you can do the like uh, study the or compute the likelihood, or before you can do the decoding problem or the figure out the uh, actual deploy of HMM. Right? Are you with me on this so far? Can I move on? Okay, good. So to explain this, these concepts, at least very quickly, we'll go through this. I'm going to use a very simple example a very silly example right which still encapsulates the essence of our w stochastic process right? so let's say the example is and i found this example from a tutorial i studied a long time ago from a very famous guy but anyway let's say you have the data let's say you are an ice cream company and you have this historical data of the number of ice creams sold versus the kind of day it was so you could have a hot day or a cold day and you could have you know one ice creams consume two ice creams or three ice creams so it's more likely that if it is a hot day you consume more people would consume more ice creams if it is a cold day people would consume less ice creams right it's it, that so, seems logical that seems intuitive right but then you also have some really crazy people who on a cold day would have three ice creams and then you also have really, really strange people who on a hot day would only have one ice cream, right? So you have a lot of this data. Let's say they have a lot of this data. And the objective now is to figure out, well, what was the sequence of the days? What was the, sequ what was the weather sequence? Remember, your days change, right? So you have a hot day, it could lead to another hot day, which could lead to another cold day another cold day so hot can lead to cold cold can lead to hot and so on and so forth right so if i had this data could i predict what kind of a date was or what was the sequence of days and by the way this brings me to another interesting application of hmms hmms are very commonly used in weather forecasting right uh, because as you can imagine one of the most uh, complex modeling processes is your weather and climates Right? So weather modeling is incredibly complex because even small pockets of uh, low pressure and high pressure, you know, very small pockets can have tremendous effects in you know, up to 50 miles, 100 miles in either direction. So weather modeling is quite complex, but HMMs are quite commonly used in weather model uh, forecasting. Right? So let's start with the first one, our likelihood computation. Right? So our likelihood computation is what? So again, um, here is our uh, simple process. I have a hot day over here and I have a cold day over here, right? The probability that one hot day will lead to another hot day is 0 0.6, let's say. So the transition probability of one hot day leading to another hot day, let's say is 0.6. Again, now, right now, I'm not talking about learning the HMM parameters, I'm just talking about Assuming that I have the HMM parameters, so what is what are those HMM parameters? I'm introducing you guys to those uh, HMM models, right? So probability that one hot day transitions to another hot day is 0.6. Probability that one hot day leads to a cold day is 0 0.5. Right? Now notice something: the total transition probability from a hot day equals one. So 0.6 plus 0.4 equals 1. That means one hot day can either lead to another hot day or a cold day. That's it. Nothing else. So 
for the sake of mathematical um, rigor, we must ensure and robustness, we must ensure that the sum of those probabilities of the transition, transition probabilities from any given state to all other states must equal one, the sum of transition probabilities, right? Similarly, if I have a cold day, then the fact that it will transition to another cold day is given by 0 0.5. And a cold day will transition to a hot day is a given probability of 0 0.5. So it's 50% likely that a cold day would lead to a hot day. But it is only 40% likely that a hot day will lead to a cold day. That's okay. I mean, this is, these are just parameters that have been, for example, established using some kind of a trading data right, in the past. So that's one part of the information that we have. The other part of the information is that if it is a hot day, if it is a hot day, probability that one ice cream is eaten is 0 0.2. Probability that two ice creams are eaten on a hot day is 0 0.3. Probability that three ice creams are eaten on a hot day is 0 0.3. <clears throat> Fair enough? Now, remember, these are the one, two, and three. These are the emission symbols, or these are the emitted symbols. This is the information that you can observe in the real world, right? This is the data that you have. This is the observed symbols. These are the states. So in each state, you can have different observed symbols. And each of those observed symbols in a given state will have different emission probabilities, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.3. Again, the total sum over here is 1.0, right? Okay. Similarly, probability of eating one ice cream in a cold day is 0 0.5. Probability of eating two ice creams in a cold day is 0 0.4. And probability of eating three ice creams in a cold day is 0 0.1, right? Okay. And then you're, of, of course, given that the initial state vector is 0 0.8, 0 0.2. What does that mean? That if I were to pick any random day out of the 365 days, the chances of it being a hot day are, is more likely, four times more likely than it being a cold day. So that means just picking any random day to start with, to start with, it, it, there's an 80% chance that I would pick up a hot day. Only 20% chance that I would start with a cold day. That's okay. Now, the question being, if the observed sequence is 313, means three ice creams, one ice cream, and three ice creams on three consecutive days, right? The first question is how likely is that this sequence of events? That's the question being asked. How likely is it that you had three ice creams eaten on the one day, on the first day? One ice cream on the second day, and third ice cream on the third day. Okay. Okay. Uh, guys, I, everybody still with me? I know I'm, this is going a little slower than I had imagined, but I really want to at least give you guys some sufficient uh, information about HMOs, right? Okay. So if you think about it, you know, if you have three, um, two states, hot and cold, and three observations, right? So how many possible state sequences you have? So you have three. So you could, uh, computationally, you could theoretically compute the probability of this observed sequence for each possible state sequence and sum them, right? Sum them. But if you really think about it, that is very, very inefficient way of doing it. Because right now you just have eight, right? In general, if you have n states and you have capital T, length of observed sequences, you would end up with n to the power t possible states or state sequences, which you would have to examine and compute the total probability, which would, in most real world applications, would pretty much be computationally intractable. There has to be a better way of doing this. There has to be a better way of doing this. For example, I'll just give you an example, right? So if I were to just take one example, right? So probability of 313. Uh -oh. Probability of uh, using 313, given it was a hot, hot and cold. So let's say the sequence of days were hot, 
hot and cold. So probability that you had three one three ice creams, given it was hot, hot and cold, is nothing but probability of three given hot times probability of one given hot times probability of three given hot. Why? Because each of these events is considered to be independent, right? Because the observed symbol depends only on that state. Only on that state, sorry. And we want that particular sequence. So all those events of that sequence must occur together, right? Must occur in sequence. So the probability actually, the net, the total probability actually is the product of the three events. So you end up with this. Now you do this for all these possible combinations. And you add them. But that is just combinationally intractable, you know, and becomes intractable very, very quickly. Because this is it, it rises exponentially. There has to be a better way of doing this, right? So the better way of doing this involves what you call as is a is sort of a recursive process. It requires what you call as gives us brings us to the uh, the forward algorithm. Right? This forward algorithm essentially, again, for the lack of better, uh, just very quickly going through this is requires building sort of a trellis. You start with the initial state, and you start looking at well, what is the probability of observing this part of the sequence? This much of the sequence, this much of the sequence, this much of the sequence, and so on and so forth, till you get to the end. Right? And now, and, and I'll explain to you what that means. But uh, again, I don't think so we have, do we have time to get into the maths behind it? Maybe not. But let me just show you something, what I mean by that. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me. Uh, Stop my video. Okay. Think of all of this, right? So, uh, let's say I want to reach here. Let's say there are these are the different time steps: one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way till t. So this t is the length of the sequence, right? And at each step, you have, of course, n states, right, denoted by these subjects. Now let's say I want to get here. Let's say I want to reach here. Let's just say I want to reach here at any given moment in time, let's say, at some time t. Now, I could reach here by starting at any one of these states and going through any of these states in the, in between. So I could go, for example, like this. Okay, I would come like this. Right? I would go like this. I could have a path like this. I could have something like this. And so on and so forth, right? Would you agree? And each of them is a valid path. Do you understand, guys? Hello? Are you still with me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So the, 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 the point I'm trying to make here is that with the forward algorithm, what you're doing recursively is trying to compute the probability of a part of the sequence starting from the beginning and then going all the way to the end, figuring out what the path probability all the way to the end. Now, again, uh, we don't really have a lot of time on this, but essentially, if you the explanation over here is you compute this variable alpha t sub t of j, which is nothing but the probability of being in state j, probability of being in state j at time step t. Right? And if you look at it carefully, it depends on alpha t minus 1 of i, a i j, b sub j of o t. Right, so it requires. So, to compute this, I need this, and the transition probabilities and the emission probability. It sort of makes sense again, right? It makes sense that in order for me to be here, in order for me to be here, I should first figure out what is the total probability of being over here, and then coming from here to here. Similarly, what is the total probability of coming reaching over here, and then this probability, and so on and so forth, right? Guys, are you with me? Okay, hopefully you are. Hopefully you understand, right? So if you just take our example, if we go through the numbers, right? So just to, I hope you guys can see these numbers, but I start with my initial value, five, initial state vector, and these, these paths, they denote 
the transition probability. So probability of hot given start. What is the probability that we start with a hot day times probability of eating three ice creams on a hot day. So over here on the top row, we have hot state. Bottom, we have cold state. These square values, they denote the number of ice creams eaten on that particular day, whether hot or cold. And these gray values, they simply represent the iteration value or the time step, if you want, right? So when I come here, this value essentially denotes the probability of it being a hot day on the, at the start, and then probability of eating three ice creams on that hot day, right? So this is 0.8 times 0.4, and you reach here, right? So you get alpha two of one as 0 0.32, and so on and so forth. So you compute all these values, and then you reach at the end of the sequence. Now the question is, well, how do I compute the likelihood of that observed sequence? Now remember, when I reach here, when I have reached here and here or here, the assumption here is that the sequence of observed symbols was 313. So even this and this, they're both, this or this, they're both valid points for me to be in because they denote, you know, the correct observed sequence. So the likelihood, the total likelihood of that particular uh, ice cream consumption sequence actually uh, happening is nothing but the sum of these two because they both represent valid paths. I could end up here or I could end up in a cold day. I could end up in a hot day or a cold day. Doesn't matter. As long as I have used, computed these values based on three, one, and three, I am fine. Yes or no, guys? Yes, sir. Right? So the total probability, or in other words, the first problem that we're trying to solve, the likelihood, is essentially nothing but the sum of these two values. Right? So I can figure out the likelihood of the observed sequence given my HML model. Is nothing but the sum of these two values. So anyway, let me just very quickly move on to the next one. So yeah, again, so this is what it is, right? So probability of O given lambda is nothing but sigma of alpha T i, right? I equals one to L. The next problem is of decoding problem. And this is actually the main way in which HMMs are deployed in the real world, how you deploy them, how you use HMMs, right? Again, in the first and the second ways of using HMMs, the implicit assumption here is that you have the HMM model. You've already got a trained HMM model. How you get to the training part, you will come to that later. I mean, that's, that's the last thing. But let's talk about the decoding problem, the most commonly used mechanism or the form of HMM, right? Again, the problem is quite simple. You're given the model. Given the observed sequence, the question now is what is the most likely state sequence? Um, or rather, what is the most likely hidden state sequence? Hidden being implied because it's just state sequence. Right? So, how did my state machine transition over the entire observed duration to yield this particular observation? sequence. That's the question being answered or being asked over here. And again, you could enumerate all the possible paths from start to end, right? And then select the path with the highest likelihood. Again, that is not an efficient way of doing that. The most efficient way of doing that is relying on the, 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 the same of the, the, the trellis approach, but now keeping track of what is the most likely path as you go through the details, right? So when you go transition from one state to the other, remember when you're sitting in one state and you have at the next time step, n possible states to go to, the idea now is we will go to that state, which is the most likely state. In other words, where the product of the transition probability along with the emission probability is the highest. Make sense? No? Guys? Yes, sir. 
right? So how do we do that? How do you keep track? You just, well, it's simple. You just keep track using a sort of a pointer, right? Every time you move, you keep track of where you came from, which particular state you came from at the previous time step. This is what you call as a back pointer, if you will. So at every step, we record the back pointer. And when you get to the end, you just look back at your uh, stack of back pointers and just follow them back to the initial state. That's it. Right? So again, using the same example, right? remember three, one, three. At each step, you compute these values. But now the values are computed based on the maximum of all the transition products, transition and emission probability products. Right? So as you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this, uh, but can you guys actually see these numbers over here? Can you see these numbers? Are these numbers visible to you? I can't hear you. Uh, okay, I, I can't hear you, but I hope I'm hoping these numbers are visible. But anyway, what they say? Yes, is, sir, it is visible. It says max of B21, this value, times this product, and this product, and this product. So essentially, we are figuring out, is this path more likely, or is this path more likely? Or is this path more likely? Right? And whichever is the highest, most likely path, we go there and just record the back propagation, the, the, the direction where we came from. So when you do that, the, you end up with this green arrows that are denoting the actual path, the state of transition. So essentially what it is telling you is that you started with uh, a hot day, you end up with a, followed by a cold day, and then you end up with a hot day. You start with a hot day, you end go to a cold day, and then you end up with a hot day. That that was the most likely weather sequence that led to three one three uh, ice creams being consumed those over those three consecutive days. Okay, guys, are you with me? So let's uh, very, very, very quickly, uh, and I want to touch on this because I want to highlight one very, very interesting, one very critical point about HMM and more specifically HMM training. So now, the third problem essentially is figuring out, well, what my HMM is, what is my model? How do I capture the essence of the process in terms of those three parameters, A, B, and pi, right? Now to do that, Iteratively, I need to learn these parameters using training data. Now, in our case, what will be the training data, right? So in our case, the training data would be a sequence of observed symbols and corresponding hidden state sequences, right? So every data set comprises of these two vectors, observed sequences and corresponding hidden state sequences. So let's say, let's take a simple example. Again, with the same uh, underlying uh, process or the physical process, I have these three O1, O1, O2, and O3. These are my three training data sets. I have my observed symbol sequences and I have the corresponding state sequences. Okay? So, first one, second one, and third one. Now, using this, can I get my HMM parameters? Well, theoretically, yes, okay, of course. So let's see how would you do it, right? So let's take a very, this is a very trivial example, a very simple example. Maybe you can do it by hand, right? So let's start by computing the initial state vector, right? So pi, pi one and pi two. Those two, we have two states, right? So for example, pi hot, what is the probability of it being a hot day, right? Is if you look at it, you have one H starting at, you have one H in the starting sequence, and then you have two cold, on the starting sequence. So H is one over three, P, pi H is one over three, and pi cold is two over three. That means in this particular case, if I were to pick any random day, the odds of it being cold day are two thirds, and odds of it being a hot day 
at the starting day is one third. Okay, fair enough. So that's my point. So my using these three data sets, I have been able to compute my pi vector. Okay. Now keep in mind, pay special attention to the words I'm using. I just said I have been able to compute. Now, some of you who are really paying attention would object to that statement, and rightfully so, but I'll get to that, right? Now, let's look at the transition probabilities. How do you compute transition probabilities now? What are the transition probabilities? Transition probabilities that we need to compute are probability of a hot day, given it is a hot day, that means transitioning from hot to hot, cold to cold, cold to hot, and hot to cold, right? Only four possible scenarios, right? One, two, three, four. Now, how do we do that? From hot to hot, let's look at, let's go back and look at our data. So hot to hot. Here is one scenario over here. One and two. Okay. Two out of how many transitions? Well, one, two, three, four, five and six total transition data that i have are six out of which the ones i am interested in are only two so i can compute my uh oh i'm sorry i made a mistake two out of three why because we are only interested in transitioning from hot sorry so how many are there there's one transition over here second transition from hot over here and the third one being over here, only two out of three. So the only interesting values for us are two out of three. I'm saying, right? So I can compute the transition probabilities as two out of three. Similarly, I can, com can compute C to C, and compute C to H, and I can compute H to C. And I get these values. Then I can compute the emission probabilities. What is the probability of consuming one ice cream on a hot day, two ice creams on a hot day, and three ice creams on a hot day. Why? This is zero out of four. Why? Because on every hot day, the number of ice creams, one ice cream is zero. I don't see any. Do you see any one ice cream on a hot day? No, 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 no. So the minimum number of ice creams consumed on a hot day were two. So I can compute. 1H, 1 given H, 2 given H, 3 given H. These are the values. Similarly, I can compute 1 given C, 2 given C, and 3 given C. Right? Now, are these the, is that it? Is that all I need to do? Well, for a very trivial example, I mean, I've just done it using simple hand calculations, but for most real world, problems are multi-dimensional, right? So there are, the, the sequence length is very long. The number of states is very, very large, right? So you can't really do this by hand. And the other thing is, is this the actual model? No, why? Because remember, all you can do is get the estimate of those HMM parameters. The HMM parameters depend on how much of a training data that you have, the goodness of the fit, if you will, the goodness of your estimate of these HMM parameters depends simply on the number of training points that you have. So with these three training points, the best value, the best data I can get are, are these values. If I were to add one more training sample, training point, these numbers would change quite possibly. So using the same rule of thumb with any machine learning, you know, application or method is larger the data, larger the training data, the better your estimates are the better your estimates are made, okay? But learning is not, is, is a non-trivial problem. Learning these parameters is a non-trivial problem, why? And again, I, I don't really have the time now to get into the math behind it, but if you think about it, you are now trying to figure out, and, and the way to do this is uh, what you call as the forward backward algorithm or also known as the bomb wells algorithm. It essentially is what you call as the expectation maximization. So you start with some initial guess for these parameters, use them to compute some intermediate variables, and then use those intermediate variables to compute updated estimates of your A and B values. And you keep doing this, you keep doing this 
till the change in a and b values becomes less than significant right just like any iterative computation scheme right you stop when the the, the change becomes negligible but the interesting bit the, the important bit about over here uh, about the, the parameter estimation for an hmmr if you think about it carefully is when you're trying to learn the transition probabilities you have to keep in mind that there is a certain length of sequence right and as we've just seen in the first part in the first part for a given observed sequence, for a given observed sequence, that means a sequence of states, or rather given an observed sequence, there are more than one hidden state sequences that can yield that observed sequence. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. That means there is no, it's not that a given observed sequence can only be uniquely expressed by a corresponding unique hidden state sequence. No, that is fundamentally not true. We've just seen that. Therefore, when you try to learn this, you have to look at all the possible path combinations. When you're trying to estimate the values, you, are, you have to look at all the paths, possible ways in which that particular observed sequence could be achieved. Now, the problem is, because you do not know the probability with which you can transition, because you're trying to learn those transition probabilities as well, this problem becomes non-trivial. But thankfully, due to mathematics, if you really want to, let me just very quickly show you what those numbers, okay, so anyway, these slides show you the math behind it, right? But the at the end of the day, all of this boils down to a very simple expression, right? You compute the, you can estimate the transition probabilities by computing the likelihood or the joint like um, probability of being in state i at current point and being in state j at the next time step. So, for example, if I want to estimate, let's, let me just explain this particular part. A i j is the transition probability of going from state i to state j in one time step. Okay. Now, Heuristically speaking, or rather statistically speaking, if you will, how would you compute that? It is nothing but the probability, the number of transitions observed where the state transitions from i to j divided by the total number of transitions out of state i. Right? If you think about it, the, if I want to estimate the transition probability of going from i to j, I should look at the total number of transitions from state i, that means could be from 1 to n, and use that as the denominator, and then only consider in the numerator the valid cases where the state actually transitions from i to j. For example, if I want to look at compute, say, a 2, 3, then I would compute, use all the cases where the system transitions from state 2 to state 3, add them up, and then divide it by all the transitions out of state 2. It could be from 2 to 1, 2 to 5, 2 to 3, 2 to 4, 2 to 10, doesn't matter. Do you understand, guys? Are you with me on this? And we do this for the entire sequence. Because remember, there's a sequence involved over here. It's not just one transition. It's a whole sequence comprised of transitions. Okay? Guys, I know I'm out of time. I think I'm, I need to stop here. I'm sure you guys are absolutely uh, tired now. So let me very quickly stop over here and uh, see if you guys have any questions. I'm going to stop here. Uh, do I need to? I need. I need to stop, right? I think you guys are quite uh, knackered by now. If you have any questions, I, I would gladly answer those questions very quickly. Yes, I know well, this is to all the participants. If you have any questions, so you can ask it one to one. Or uh, if there is any network problem uh, or any streaming yeah, problem, so you can also write the same in the chat box and I'll ask it to sir on your behalf.
Anyone? So again, uh, let me very quickly mention one of the, my favorite examples of how HMMs are being used, right? HMMs are used very commonly in using social media and data for social media to predict how the population is behaving, how population is going to react. I'm sure all of you must have heard about this possible election fraud in the US, right? Where they, they accused Russia of uh, influencing the outcome of the results. You guys remember this? No, yes, no, 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 no. yes. I hope you guys must know. Even in India, right? A lot of these conspiracy theorists, they say that, well, you could by simply planting fake news and then observing how humans react to those news by looking at their YouTube comments, their Twitter, uh, their tweets and stuff like that, how they react to those news. You can predict how these human subjects will respond. Now think about that. That is a classical, you can't observe the human subject directly. The only thing you can do is observe how they behave to then predict how the human will be. So by trying to, by using their, the activity of a human being, online and following the sequence of those activities, you can go back and try to predict how that human being will, is going to behave when subjected to a different set of stimuli. This is very, very commonly used now in social engineering, you know, predicting um, purchase patterns by social giants. Facebook does that. They're basically building a profile. When, I, when they say they're building a profile, what do they mean by that? They're trying to build a model that describes your state transition. How do you feel when you're subjected to a certain stimuli? When you're in a certain state, how would you change from that state to? So, for example, if I am happy today, let's say I'm feeling neutral, and I read a, a bad piece of news. Whether it is fake or not, I do not know. How likely is it that I am going to become sad after reading that? Right? Not everybody will become sad. Some somebody who is who knows that this is fake news who start laughing about it. Right? So looking at just simply thinking, looking at how a human subject reacts online to an event or to a video or to a tweet. You can actually go back and model how they would react to a different set of stimuli. So this is and, and, and this is a classical example of how HMMs are modeled. They are very commonly used in speech processing, predicting uh, what is going to be spoken, how what has been spoken, right? Because if you look at your building blocks of speech, right? you have uh, phones, phonemes, right? Vowels, words, sentences. So if you look at how the vocal tract is behaving, how it is, if you are able to model that, you can predict what is going to be said before it is completed. Those are the fundamental speech.